Good evening. How are we? Oh, that was. I'm not gonna say terrible because that's 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 a tough word, but that was that was rough. Okay. I'm gonna say good evening. Oh, that's just wonderful. I'm so I'm so happy now. Um, our our first our first hymn that we're gonna sing tonight is uh, I Need Thee Every Hour. I just have a couple questions for you. Um, how often do you think of the Savior in that way? How often do you think I need Jesus? Can you truly say that I need him every hour, and is it just limited to an hour? When was the last time that you said, I am in dire need of Jesus? The need for Jesus is an exigent need for Jesus. It's pressing. It's, it's demanding. You need him right now to intercede for you before the Father, and you need him right now because through him you can be forgiven. And so we're going to sing, I, I, I need thee every hour, and, and extol the, the name of Christ, because he truly is the only one that can satisfy the wrath of God. Nothing we do. Let's stand together and sing, I need thee every hour. coming to Christ has anything to do with our own merit or our own self-worth before God, let us continue to sing about the sufficiency of Jesus Christ with not in me. No list of sins I have not done, no list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like Can earn myself a place with you Oh God, be merciful to me I am a sinner through and through My only hope of right 
righteousness is not in me, but only you. No humble dress, no fervent prayer, no lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was borne by him, and he alone can give me rest. No separation from the world. I do, no gift I give, can cleanse my conscience, cleanse my hands, I cannot cause my soul to live, but Jesus died and rose again, the power of death is overthrown, my God is merciful to me, and merciful in Christ alone, my righteousness. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was borne by him, and he alone can give me rest. Yes, he alone can give me rest. Amen. You may be seated. feel myself being pinned to the front here. We added a row of seats here to help alleviate some of our seating in the morning. And uh, so we're backing, feeling like we're getting backed up. Uh, it's good to see you tonight. Grateful for the opportunity to be together. We're grateful for how God works and uh, in our lives through his word. And it's just always a thrill to see people coming back for more of the teaching of God's word. A couple of things, uh, just maintenance. One is the Donchenkos made it to Georgia safely. They're there, and we're grateful. They're beginning to look for housing and other things to get oriented while they're there, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, Klingsheims are expecting this week to be the week where uh, baby Klingsheim arrives. Uh, we're not sure whether it's a boy or a girl yet, unless you guys know. Do you know? Yeah. Oh. oh, you're going to let us know. As soon as you know, you'll let us know. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So we're, we're praying for that. Tuesday is her due date, so we want to be in prayer for uh, Klingsheims, and it's really hard on David. Um, and we'll be praying for Brittany, too, through this. And um, Dave, you're, gonna, you're doing okay? Okay, good, good, good. Well, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep praying for you. David's mother is here uh, from North Carolina, so it's great to have you with us as well. So blessings to you all on, uh, on the birth of of your little one as it is upcoming. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I think I might be able to answer these and get to some live questions if you have any. So I'll uh, respond to those if you'd like. The first question uh, is um, given to me here. In Matthew 19, 16 to 30, Jesus talks about how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Is this symbolic of the narrow passageway or gate in Israel called the eye of the needle? Or was Jesus being literal in, s in a sewing needle? Um, in Matthew chapter 19, 16 to 30, is this passage. And the entire context is one in which he is teaching that it is necessary for you to be perfect in order to gain God's favor. And since no one is perfect, no one can gain God's favor. And the idea of, of salvation is that we, we loose ourselves from the delusion that we can somehow save ourselves, that we can become good enough, or we can deny our flesh sufficiently in order to gain God's favor. And the statement that is made here by Jesus is that it is impossible. You cannot do enough, be enough, keep the law enough, do enough good deeds in order to gain the favor of God. And so the reference to a rich man in this context is the man who is self-dependent. That's who the rich man is. This is not 
class warfare. This isn't somebody that has hostility to the rich and saying, if you're rich, you can't go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying. But the characteristic of the rich, particularly in Jesus' day, and it is true in our day as well, is that it's very difficult for somebody who has all their needs able to be met by their own resources. They don't have to turn to God. They can buy whatever they want, whatever they need. Pray for, give us this day our daily bread. Who does that? Who does that? And I have to admit, I don't pray for my daily bread. I uh, don't need to. I have meals in my freezer for months that I would be able to access. Um, So it's not something we think about typically, and so we're very self-dependent. And what Jesus is saying here is that if you approach salvation with self-dependence, a.k.a. a rich man, it, it is easier for a real camel to bas- pass through the eye of an actual needle than for such a person to enter into the kingdom of heaven, meaning it is an impossibility. You cannot do it. And that's what he's saying. So I, I believe that it's a literal reference here and not some kind of it's just harder for them. I think it's impossible for them unless they become like a little child, totally dependent, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he says elsewhere. So that's how I would approach that. And um, it provides us the emphasis on how dramatically dependent we are on Jesus Christ to save us and not feeling as if we can somehow kick in and do it ourselves. Second question is, um, uh, regarding Zipporah circumcising her son, um, was God going to kill her son as she was trying to, uh, and she was trying to appease God? Where was Moses, and how, did he, how was he involved? Uh, go back to Exodus, um, I believe it's 4, that these, this story is um, provided for us. Let's see, where are we here? Uh, yeah, 25. Verse 24 says, Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. That would be Moses, is the one under the threat. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet and said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, it it seems to me that um, there is a a possibility in this passage (coughs) that there is a emphasis on the firstborn um, um, Go back to verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And then (coughs) the him in verse 24 can refer to either Moses or to their firstborn son because of the context. So it's possible, (coughs) excuse me, that there is a reference here to God dealing with Moses because he had failed to circumcise his firstborn son. And Zipporah realizes what's going on. It's the child that is actually in danger, not Moses. And so that there is this uh, threat to Zipporah's son. And so she goes ahead, which Uh, circumcision was not a Midianite um, ritual. It was something that was given to the Jew alone to distinguish them from any other of the Gentile nations. And so Zipporah may have resisted Moses' um, desire to circumcise. You know, sometimes women don't necessarily cooperate with their husband's desires. And Zipporah may have balked at this. You're not going to do this. And when Um, God either threatened Moses in Moses' life or their son's life 
Zipporah says okay, and she relents and yields and goes ahead and says okay, and then takes the knife and, and circumcises it, uh, the boy herself. <coughs> now, it's possible that uh, this was a way by which God was emphasizing the need for absolute sanctification on the part of the uh, people of God. Moses, being the leader of God, ought to be the one who sets an example of submission and yieldedness to God, and when he had failed to do that, whether by his own neglect or Zipporah's opposition, whichever it is, <coughs> it's possible that there was um, this... Um, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. <coughs> I, uh, I think that, you know, we recognize that circumcision, you say, what a barbaric, what a barbaric ritual. I mean, this is just barbarity. But in reality, it's very symbolic because probably the place, I don't want to get overly graphic, but probably the place where mankind's sin is demonstrated most quickly, most commonly, most universally is in sexual purity. And the organ that was a, uh, involved in sexual Im impurity was to be uh, circumcised in an effort to provide a statement and symbolic sanctification that emphasized the need for people to live pure lives. And that's why this issue of circumcision was so important to God, because it represented the necessity to, to confess sin and the presence of sin. The probably apex of sin is the sexual sin that exists. Because even in 1 Corinthians, excuse me a second. <coughs> in 1 Corinthians it says, every, uh, every other sin committed is committed outside the body. But immorality is a sin against the body. So there is a dichotomy, it seems, of sexual sin from other kinds of sin because of the impact of that sin upon the person's body. And in addition, uh, sexual sins are, a, are particularly profane, as I've mentioned, because um, in procreation, that is the act of reproduction, in procreation, God allows mankind to get the closest that he will ever get to any divine prerogative, and that, and th and that prerogative is creation. We are involved in creation, in procreation, and that's the closest God allows us to get to his prerogative. So the abuse of it is particularly heinous to God. And circumcision is a depiction of the need for us to, to confront the propensity of sin in our lives. And the most common defeat in sin is with sexual purity. And therefore, circumcision became the sign of the covenant. So Moses was held accountable as the one who was going to be the leader of Israel for being compliant with the covenantal provisions that God had mandated. And uh, Zipporah either was saving Moses' life because m God was going after Moses, or saving her son's life because God was going after her son. And there's all kinds of discussion as to who the him in that verse is, uh, whether it's Moses or her son. Uh, I would probably lean toward the son, but uh, that's uh, for probably better minds than mine. Okay? Um, it says, was she approached by a theophany? Don't know. It may have simply been that she was aware that her son was ill and that the deduction was that they were not compliant. And, and if, you, you know, if, if your child gets seriously ill, you begin to rake through your soul as to what could be c happening here. And it could be that she was just by the Spirit of God convicted that this is the sin that this couple was guilty of and uh, concluded that that's what needed to be done. Why did God want to kill her son? I think I've answered that. Did she think it was her son and not Pharaoh's son as referred to the previous narrative? No, I think the context suggests that uh, Pharaoh's son was also going to be killed ultimately. Was the circumcision valid having not been performed by a priest? And I would say yes because the Aaronic priesthood was not yet established. That would not be established until later. I, uh, uh, I was reading quietly, and this theological grenade went off. So I'm dazed. Your thoughts, please? 
Well, <coughs> that's the best I can do on that one. So y- you just have to let the dust from that grenade settle and then go to the, you know, medic. So any other questions that you'd like to ask? Anything that you've been reading that you'd like to know about? Anything that you'd like to ask? Yeah, Wes. That's what makes the Nazarite vow so significant because it was great, it was a great anomaly uh, for them to, to allow their hair to grow, which caused the Nazarite to stick out with greater clarity. And I think there's a level of that, and this is supposition, but I think there, the hair issue uh, enabled them to be held accountable because of such a visible indication that they're, because if, if, if the Nazarite vow was something that was more private, like don't drink any alcoholic beverages, which was part of it, don't touch any dead body, which was part of it, um, and something else, let's say y- y- you were not to, you know, eat meat or whatever it was, um, which was not part of it, but for imagination's sake or illustration's sake, if that's all it was, then it would be... <coughs> easy for you to violate your vow with nobody knowing that you're a Nazarite. But when your hair is long and it's unnatural and it's a disgrace and it's obviously done for the purpose of identifying you as being under this Nazarite vow, all of a sudden accountability for touching dead bodies and not drinking alcohol becomes all the more uh, notable and you're accountable. So that if you did drink alcohol with the long hair, hey, what are you doing? You're a Nazarite, right? So there's accountability that we that would be present there. And I think that's probably the cause for that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Tim. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're talking about John. <coughs> if you go over there to John 3, pardon my voice, I, <coughs> I am, uh, I don't think I abused it this morning. I was fairly docile, right, this morning when I was p- speaking, so I don't know what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um. It says, uh, verse 5, uh, verse 4 says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I believe that Jesus is not referring to physical birth here because it would be a kind of an kept an obvious statement, you know, so I, I, I don't think that's where he's going here. And I certainly don't believe it's baptism because baptism does not contribute to our being born again. But there are two things that do contribute to our being born again that are referenced with water and spirit. And of course, the water being the word of God. Um, we are born again through the agency of the word of God. Look at Titus chapter 3 for uh, uh, an elaboration on this. In Titus chapter 3, look at verse 5, where he says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done, but uh, according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, you have two things coupled there that correspond to the coupling of Jesus by washing of the water or being born of water and the spirit. So there's a coupling of these two things, the, the, the washing of regeneration and the uh, uh, renewing of the Holy Spirit or the um, um, uh, 
Where did it go? Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, raw, uh, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So those two things coupled, the washing and the Spirit, born of water and of Spirit, there seems to be that, that connection. And then look at Ephesians 5.26 to further elaborate, Ephesians 5.26, where the scripture says, um, so that he might sanctify her, uh, re- a reference to Jesus and his church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the washing of regeneration is the new life that the word of God brings to us and washes us through the word of God. It's the sanctifying power of the word of God whereby we are washed or cleansed through the agency of scripture um, that brings that cleansing, the washing of water with the word. And then also we recognize, look at um, uh, the idea in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where the scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which that faith is the means uh, or the avenue by which salvation is secured is through faith. And what is it that produces that faith? It's the word of God. So we are, it is clear that we are born again through the agency of the Word of God. We were born again, uh, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, that is, the Word of God. And so we understand that the, the two elements used to bring us life is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And the water there is a reference to the Word of God. And the Spirit, of course, is the one who regenerates. So the water is the means of regeneration. The Spirit is the agent of regeneration. And so you are born again when you are washed, uh, or you are born again by the water and by the Spirit. So the third option, since you put me in a box and give me no alternative, is the Word of God. Okay? Hopefully I didn't lead you all around for nothing. Any other questions? Another minute or two. Robbie. Uh huh. Yes, I think that there was a there was a practice that um, um, became um, commonplace. That when you sanctify yourself, it's one of the things that God says will help you um, be distinct. So I think use of alcohol became commonplace. Although I wouldn't push it too far, because I don't know that touching dead bodies was something everybody went around doing regularly either. Uh, so it, it, would be, it would be something that, even if it was only on rare occasions, would be something that you would not be willing to do. So I don't know that you would press it to say that it was commonplace because the other provision was not commonplace either. All right, well, let's... Um, Go to James and let me pick up and study with you in the book of James. We're, Lord willing, going to finish chapter 1 today as we um, are involved in exegeting and teaching through this book. Uh, James helps us in our text for today to address the issue that is all too common in the church, and that is the issue of externals and how so many churches are all about appearances, external conformities, legalistic standards, um, not stepping out of what you would call convention, 
right? That you have various conventions and that if you don't comply to the convention or if you stick out as odd, then you can't be godly. And there's all kinds of pressure by churches for people to conform externally. And as long as you're externally conforming, then you're good. I, I had this um, tension with my children because simply because they behaved, meaning didn't defy me, did not allow me to believe that everything was good with them in their hearts and in their relationship with the Lord. Uh, one of the biggest problems in Christian schools, and I'm for Christian education, I think it's great. I used Christian education for my children. I also publicly educated many of my children, and I homeschooled, well, I didn't. My wife homeschooled many of our children. Um, and so I'm not advocating one or decrying one or any way. We've used them all. But one of the problems with Christian school is that Christian school students sometimes learn how to conform to the rules without any internal realities. And as long as they're not stepping out of line, they're branded a good kid. And that can transfer into churches too. That as long as people don't step out of line, (coughs) then they're good Christians. When in reality, their hearts are sour, the relationships are sick, uh, their fervency is missing, their evangelistic zeal is absent. There's a lot that's not right in their lives, but they're conforming, and so everybody concludes that they're right. And James goes after this. I mean, he goes after this hard uh, in this section. He's been going after it, obviously, and providing us various tests of authenticity in our faith. (coughs) And in this uh, couple of verses, he goes after it with a, with a knife to the jugular, if you will. Let's read these verses, 26 and 27. He says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Let's pray quickly and ask God's Spirit to help us as we open the Word of God. Lord, we are dependent upon you to give us the understanding of your Word. We can academically, intellectually appreciate what's written here, but it's not going to transform us unless your Holy Spirit works in our hearts. He is the one who guides us into all truth. He is our helper, the teacher, the one who has anointed us, And I pray that you would help us, Lord, tonight as we look at these verses to be helped by your Spirit and for the, or to the end that we are transformed even this evening by our time together here. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you, we commit your word to you, and ask that you would use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want us to understand tonight, and I think this is what James is driving at, is that external religion that brings conformity leaves a sinner without the transformation that grace brings. See, grace transforms people's lives from inside out. Religion allows people to conform outside, but leaves the inside unmolested. And an unmolested inside is a is a uh, unchanged, untransformed, unsanctified state. And we don't want that. We want our hearts to be transformed, not just our behavior to be acceptable. Christianity is not a behavioristic faith. Now, this is not to suggest that we don't have commandments that we're to obey and things that we ought to do and things that we're called upon not to do. Clearly, there are commands that God gives to us. But most often, those commands cut to the heart and allow the heart to be addressed, not just externals. When we emphasize the externals and leave the heart unmolested, we have what James calls here a worthless religion. It's worthless. Uh, I've been on planes before, seeking to witness to people. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that, by the way. If you haven't flown lately, you can know this. You get on the plane and everybody sits down and pop immediately 
go their earphones on and you know they have these noise canceling earphones and all that kind of stuff that almost everybody has now so you feel like grabbing them and saying excuse me <laughs> uh, can we talk and so it's getting increasingly less frequent that you're able to do that but anyway I was talking one time and, and uh, uh, the guy says to me what do you do I, and I said well I'm a, I'm a pastor and he goes oh pfft, I hate religion and I said you know so do I how could you hate religion if you're a pastor I said, did you know that Christianity teaches that religion damns? Religion damns souls. He goes, nah, I didn't know that's what, but how can that, isn't Christianity a religion? I said, no, it isn't. Now, come on. I said, no, it, it really isn't. Be, uh, just listen to this, okay? If you don't want to talk after this, I'm, I'm okay. Religion is man's effort to reconcile himself to God. Christianity begins with the understanding that man can't do that. Man cannot reconcile himself to God. Christianity is not a religion because Christianity is about God doing everything to reconcile us to himself, not us doing what we need to do to reconcile him to us. It's a completely different set altogether. All religion is a set containing subsets of denominations and different cults and varieties of things that all do the same thing. They come up with their own individual way to get themselves to God. Religion is a completely different thing because of God's desire to bring us to himself. It's a completely different thing. And we had a very nice chat after that. But that's the essence of religion. And we find here in verse 26, the emptiness of religion demonstrated. So James comes and he says the religion is empty. It is focused on externals. Focused on externals. There's what, that's what he says. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, he's following up on his previ previous discussion on the distinction between one who merely audits the truth. Remember a person who hears the word but is not a doer? The auditor of truth? Versus the applier of truth. The person who applies the truth is the believer. The person who merely audits the truth is the unbeliever. And the unbeliever who audits truth can be very religious. Very religious. The self-assessment by the unbeliever is that his life is able to be approved based on what he is able to do naturally. That is, in his own strength. Uh, without the supernatural transformation of the heart. And that's what he says there in verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And for him, the natural face is okay. It's not, it's not to be uh, seen as a negative thing at all, the natural face. It's like the Fonz, right, who goes into the, those of you who are young don't get this, but he goes into the, uh, the Al's Diner's bathroom and he pulls his comb out of his pocket and looks at himself in the mirror and goes, whoa, you know, that's good. A, yeah, A, or whatever it was. I, I, my dad didn't allow me to watch that show often. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The point is, you, you look at yourself and you approve it. That's the natural man. You approve it. The spiritual man sees himself in the mirror and begs God to transform him into the image of Christ, change him from what he is to what God is able to make him. That's the spiritual man. That's the man who has the Spirit of God in him. He's not satisfied with the way he is. He wants to be more like Christ. And therefore, he does what he's told in the Word of God. It is something that he does. He states here in our verse, if, however which is a condition that assumes the reality of the fact. Since someone might think himself to be, he provides the example of an errant opinion, thinks himself, or supposes, makes the supposition, or considers himself to be religious. The problem with this is that the assessment of whether he is religious is based on criteri criteria that are humanistic, achievable, man-made. It's, it's the assessment of man 
by man that falls far short to the standards and expectations of God. So religion essentially is the way that man concocts that he can be found pleasing to God. But the God to whom he is pleasing is a God of his own design, right? So he's, he's defining what will please the God he wants to serve, and then he does what is needed to please that God. But it's not the true God, and it is not allowing God to set the standards of what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, what is pleasing to him and what is not pleasing to him, because we all recognize, ultimately, that there is no one that pleases God except the Son of God himself, the only one of whom God is ever quoted as having said, I am well pleased. It's only in the Son of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And if we are not like Jesus, we are not pleasing to God. But thankfully, because of grace, we are able to become pleasing to God because we are found in Christ Jesus by faith. And it's the righteousness of Christ that we boast of, not our own. It is what he makes us by grace that enab enables us to be reconciled to him. But when you are assessing yourself based on human standards and that religious concoction of righteousness, you're not pleasing to God. Man's priority is on being religious. Uh, it's interesting, this word religious here can be used in a, a proper sense of sincere liturgical worship. Okay, so this term can be used in a very positive sense, but it also can be used in a very negative sense, which seems to be the context that he is using it here. And in this context, it's focusing on the ceremonial worship of God, the liturgical, the rote, the external expressions of worship that um, are found in both proper worship and empty worship, because the heart is the only thing that distinguishes between the two. Two people can stand together, and both of them sing and raise their hands and worship. One of them is pleasing to God. The other one is not. Now, hopefully both of them are, because their heart is in it. But one could be completely devoid of any genuine spirituality whatsoever. They may be committed to sin. Uh, you can be in sinful relationships. You can be in sinful practices, sinful, all kinds of sinful thoughts, attitudes, things, and then look oh so good in worship or in some external managed presentation. Essentially, what James is addressing here is reputational. The impression that we're able to make on others as we do what is needful to make ourselves look good through various religious disciplines or deprivations or discussions or duties that we do that cause people to look at us as righteous. So that's what he is looking at. The term, uh, one of the commentators said this, the term denotes the zealous and diligent performance of the outward and ceremonial aspects of worship. So it can be external conformity that does not necessarily display an inward reality. Yet, such external emphases do not accomplish genuine righteousness. Go back to Matthew chapter 6 and look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 1, the evangelist says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. In other words, it is possible to practice righteousness and do righteous things that will cause other people to think you're righteous, but it's all external. It's all to be seen by other men. Verse 5, he continues, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. I say to you, they have their reward in full. In other words, the only... Um, the, the only blessing they're going to get is the blessing of appearing good and not actually being good. Look at, uh, go back to Matthew 23. He continues his assault 
on such externalism. In Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move with them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. And he goes on to just talk about how external they are and how they project an image and how they require respect and they do everything they do in order to promote themselves. That is despicable in the eyes of God. And James is going to diagnose such a heart as representing a worthless religion, something that has no value. And that's where we come in here in the latter part of verse 26, where not only is there a focus on externals by those who will rely on religion, but there is a failure of externals. There's a failure. It doesn't do anything. It does not sanctify you. You can avoid what historically has been known as the dirty dozen or nasty nine sins or abominations. You can avoid them and not be righteous or godly. He says here, if a person thinks himself to be religious, in other words, he has managed his external presentation very carefully, tightly, so that everybody thinks that he is godly, and yet he cannot bridle his tongue. That becomes a telltale indication of a worthless religion. The problem with emphasizing externals is that the internal realities are ignored. People can attend church regularly, can they not, and be ungodly. People can take communion and be baptized, can they not, and remain ungodly. People can pray regularly out of discipline, yet remain ungodly. People can give money, significant amounts, in an offering, yet remain ungodly. People can read the Bible through multiple times, and yet remain ungodly. People can remain chaste and moral, and yet remain ungodly. One cannot make oneself righteous inwardly by merely seeking to alter one's behavior. But when one is transformed internally, there is inevitable external manifestations of integrity that can appear similar to the person who is merely focusing on externals. So it's very difficult for one person to judge another as to whether the externals that they're viewing really indicates godliness or whether it indicates religious fervor. It's difficult for us to know. Here, James indicates that the worthlessness of external conformity and religion is exposed by the tongue, by the tongue. As is demonstrated repeatedly throughout Scripture, a corrupt heart will end up expressing itself through the mouth your mouth. Look at Matthew chapter 12 in this regard. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart or overflows the heart. Um, demonstrating that what is inside is going to manifest itself through your tongue. Look at verse 18. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Those are the things that defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. In other words, 
you're, you're concerned about externals, whether someone has washed their hands before they ate. That's an external standard of righteousness. You're not going to defile yourself spiritually based on whether you wash your hands before you eat. Now, you can defile your body biologically and get sick because you don't wash your hands. That's a possibility. But spiritually, that's not where defilement comes from. Jesus is saying defilement comes from within you already. It's already there. It's natural. It's the sinful nature that expresses itself. And out of the mouth proceeds all of these things. Out of the heart proceed all of these things. And the mouth, that which proceeds from the mouth, comes from the heart. And that defiles you. So the mouth is a portal giving access to the things in the heart to find expression. Look at, look at Luke. Go back to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. In this regard, you find another passage that's helpful. Luke chapter 6, look at verse 45. Luke six forty-five. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart uh, out of his evil treasure, b- treasure brings forth what is evil, for the mouth speaks from that which is filling one's heart. So the mouth expresses what is in the heart. And I, I would suggest that this is um, even something that doesn't have to be articulated, but thoughts that are formed that you catch before you actually utter them. That would count as the heart expressing itself through the mouth. So you don't have to actually say it. You just think about it. I remember when I was a teenager and I was working as a laborer mixing mud for a plastering company. And I was ripped during those days, hoeing that mud, you know, and just carrying these huge five-gallon buckets full of mud and um, hoisting them up to scaffolding for these guys. I was in the midst of a culture that was so vulgar and profane. These guys were cussing and swearing and saying all kinds of different things and, and um, I found myself thinking that. I would get mad and I would all of a sudden think the way they spoke. I went to my dad and I said, Dad, man, I am just so vexed because I'm not actually saying it. So I'm guarding my mouth. I'm not actually saying it, but I'm thinking it. And when I get angry, I'm thinking vulgar words. He goes, well, son, you know, it's out of, the ma- out of the heart those things come. The problem is not just your mouth or your thoughts. It's the heart. Those things come from the heart. You need to continually sensitize your heart to the Spirit of God because He is not generating those thoughts. It's your flesh that is generating those thoughts. Exposure to those men that are generating those thoughts. And you're not um, processing the things that you're hearing properly in the power of the Spirit. So I started really agonizing trying to deal with those things so that because I was definitely afraid that in front of some elder one day I was going to get mad and let something rip and then that was going to really mess things up you know for my dad or whatever and so I wasn't interested in that and of course I was juvenile and not necessarily as mature as I needed to be because the bigger concern is what reflection that would be on Christ Jesus not just my family the result of religion which is defined as man's attempt to get himself to God, is that all of his efforts to reform, to restrain, to resolve, and be righteous are worthless. Fruitless, powerless, lacking value. They don't do anything. It is worthless because their religious pursuits are not energized by the gospel. There is no internal activity of grace by the Holy Spirit. It's all self-resolve, reformation, external conformity. And James is saying it's worthless. How, how much of your spiritual life is just an attempt to be seen as a good person? And yet inside there is this cauldron of defilement that grace has yet to address. Nobody knows because externally you look good. there is this need to process the gospel of grace because grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts 
and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's what grace does. It doesn't address your externals. It addresses your internals, and that's important. I want to reserve the rest of this until later, so I want to give a story to you. Or an illustration. Let's say it's an illustration of a story. People often ask me when they're teenagers or college students wanting to get married so on, they come in for counseling and they want to know what's appropriate sexual activity, right? What can we do, what can't we do? Can we hold hands? Can we hug? Can we kiss? What can and what can we not do? I said, what's the Bible say? Well, that's the problem. We can't find anything in the scripture that says that, right? We can't find anything. Usually people out of desperation go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where it says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what most mothers tell their sons, right? That's the biblical standard, son. <laughs> the problem is when you sit under good preaching, you come to an exegesis of that passage and that has nothing to do with that. It's a euphemism for marriage and Paul is advocating not marrying, staying single, right? And the euphemism of touching a woman has the idea of the consummation of the marriage union and being married, right? That's, so that really doesn't help a dating couple. So what are God's standards? Well, it's interesting that God is more interested in the inside than on the outside. He's more interested in the heart than he is the behavior. So what's he do? He doesn't address the behavior. He doesn't tell you what you're able to do. He doesn't tell you, thou shalt not hold hands. Thou shalt not give any frontal hug. Thou shalt not put an arm around a woman. You're married. <laughs> Go ahead, you're married. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah. Or any of these things. It doesn't go there. It doesn't say that. How come? Because you can be seething with immorality and abide by those externals and think you're fine. So what does he do? He addresses your heart. What is your desire for that other person? Is your desire for that other person that they be pure? Is your desire for yourself to demonstrate your yieldedness to God's spirit? So, he does something really, really difficult for people to process. He basically says, be honest with your desires. Let me show you where he says that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, go there. Often when I go through this passage with a couple in premarital counseling, they, they go, oh, uh, this is really hard. This is, this is hard. And I go, it is. He says, uh, look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. And we're going to say the vessel there is the body in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. So the standard of God is that you not allow lustful passion to be enraged or inflamed. It's almost like that Song of Solomon passage which talks about don't awaken love before it's time, right? That idea of allowing lust to roar in your life. Don't allow that. Cut that off. And then it says in verse 6, and here's the standard, that no man transgress and defraud, defraud his brother in the matter. The brother there is a, is a, um, a, a, a gender non-specific reference to the believer. All right, so... It, men and women are in included here in brother, and that man is gender uh, nonspecific either. Uh, so it refers to a woman treating her boyfriend or fiance and a man treating his girlfriend or fiance, either one. Uh, it's reversible. The issue is a person is not to defraud another person in this matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you and solemnly warned you 
so that God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Later in, in Scripture, he says that God judges um, the uh, uh, fornicator and the adulterer. God judges them. So he avenges himself against the fornicator and adulterer. So the standard here is don't transgress and defraud another person. That's the standard. Don't defraud another person. Well, what does that mean? Well, the idea of defraud means that you are not to raise in another person an expectation that you're not going to fulfill. Basically, it means don't allow someone else to be turned on by you. That's, that's the standard. Don't allow that to happen. Now, you might be able to hold hands and not have a problem. The problem is you just have to be honest. And not many of us are willing to be honest. We want somebody to tell us, what can I do and what can I do? Because we are so geared to externalisms. We're so geared to not have to wrestle through my own heart and my own struggle with righteousness and what's right in the eyes of God. And I'm not willing to be honest with myself as to the fact, I really like this. A boyfriend might look at a girlfriend and say, hey, wear that dress again. I like that one. Does it cause you problem? No. It doesn't cause me any problem at all. I really like that dress. They're not being honest with themselves. Why do they like that dress? Because it really, really makes you look attractive. You know, unlike, <laughs> unlike Abraham Lincoln in that Geico commercial where his wife you know, says, hey, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> and what's he say, right? That's, some of you may not have seen that one. I, <laughs> my wife has her sand shovel up saying, you're digging out here. Anyway. Um, <laughs> the point of the matter is that we're simply not willing to be honest with ourselves. We would prefer to have some kind of an external mandate imposed upon us that tells us what we're able to do and not do and God doesn't do that he makes it tough on us so that we have to be honest before him and rely upon his spirit and not just conform to some external conformity one of the problems that believers have is that we're not willing to be honest about what we struggle with and we want legalism makes religion easier. Grace makes religion harder because grace demands more than legalism requires. That's why people rush to legalism. Because I, just tell me what I'm supposed to do, I'll do that. Well, that's not enough. That's why, like, people say, I like the idea of tithe. I like the idea of tithe. Because I know if I give my 10%, God will be pleased. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. You may not be able to afford 10%. Legalistically imposing 10% may be irresponsible. Or you might need to give 20% because the scripture says, according to the way in which God has prospered you. You may be able to, you know, feel that 10% is no sacrifice at all. It's like a tip in a restaurant, Right? But when you give to the point where it's actually a sacrifice for you, that's what grace requires. Legalism gives you a percentage. Just give the 10%. Grace causes you to have to wrestle. And as the scripture says, as a man purposes in his heart, so let him give. That's grace. And that requires interacting with God's spirit. And maybe, dare I say it, not hitting the 10% on one direction or another? Now, not deacons here would say, Pastor, don't be, you know, talking people out of 10%. I'm not, uh, uh, and, but that's not my point. The point is, it's easy to be a legalist. It's hard to be truly godly. And that's what James is getting at here. There's more to say about this, and we'll do it, Lord willing, in a subsequent time together. Let's pray. Father, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is so rich. It's magnificent because it liberates us from our slavery to sin. 
and it gives to us freedom in Christ, freedom from the guilt of sin, so that we are able to know that the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, cleanses us of all sin. It also liberates us from the power of sin. That sin does not have to reign in our mortal bodies, but that we are able to dedicate and offer ourselves as servants of righteousness and holiness because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us when he saved us. He's given to us new life. The old man has died, and we are new creatures through the gospel. We've been washed with the water of the word, and we have been regenerated by the Spirit of God to a new creature. And we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you, Lord, that one day we look forward to being rid of the flesh and the sin of our flesh when we are glorified. We know that that day will come when we will see Jesus and we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as Christ is pure. That tells us that he is our standard. Not some legalistic code or set of rules or standards, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself is our standard, and we cannot be satisfied until we are like him. Help us to be honest before you, responding to your spirit and the convicting work that he does to draw us away from feeling that we're okay as long as we are complying with some man-made set of rules and standards. Help us, Lord, to not be rebellious and defiant and, and blatantly um, indulgent in the name of liberty. Paul says that we are not to use our liberty for an occasion for our flesh. And again, you're speaking to us, Lord, demanding honesty. Help us as your children to yearn to be godly, to have your grace inform our hearts and not just call, call us to conform externally, but help the external demonstrations of righteousness to be genuine and filled with integrity because you are doing a work of grace in our hearts. We yearn for that work. We yearn for the ministry of your spirit in us to transform us into the more closely into the image of Christ. We we yearn for that. Thank you for the progress you've made. Thank you for the hope that you will continue that work in us until the day of Christ. We desire to be cooperative. So do that work, Father, for your own glory and the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Blessings to you. Thank you for being here. And Lord willing, we'll see you again on next Lord's Day. As if I'm legalistically going to give questions next week. No.